October 2013 marks the month and the year when I was first granted a changing visa to visit Europe on a business trip. At that time, I was working in the procurement department of one of the largest Saudi business groups. And that group sent me to Cannes of France to represent them during a global event called the Duty Free and Travel Retail Global Summit. In such a global event, you usually see those luxurious brands like uh, Chanel, Dior, Hugo Boss, Versace, and so on, presenting their products, exhibiting their niche products, and engaged in meetings with their clients who come from all over the world. For me, they treated me with special welcome. They saw me as someone who represents the giant Saudi group that, uh, that runs exclusively the outlets in all the duty-free and travel retail in all the airports of Saudi Arabia, and this is very important to their industry. During the meetings that I held with them, they told me how keen they were uh, on ensuring my uh, comfort uh, during my stay there in France. I felt happy and pleased, and sometimes I said, uh, is this kind of special welcome extended to me because of my expertise, skills, special talents, or because of something else. Anyway, I returned to Saudi Arabia with a lot of positive energy. I started sharing experience with my colleagues. I told them, people there treat you in a great way, regardless of your color, regardless of your religion, reg regardless of where you come from. And people, especially the Yemeni one who live in Saudi Arabia, started asking me one question repeatedly. How did you get the visa in the first place? You're a Yemeni person, and it's always difficult for Yemenis to get the visa. I told them, simply, I met the requirements of the visa and I got it. That's the answer to your question. A few months later, the group that I represent told me you're going to go to Italy again to represent the group in another global event, which is the Cosmobrof Worldwide, that is usually held or annually held in Polonia of Italy. I applied for the visa and I got it easily, within a week. I went to Italy, but there wasn't anything different. The same great hospitality, the same great invitations that I had in Cannes. They, they invited me for lovely dinners and I was enjoying it, of course. Uh, and when I returned to Saudi Arabia, the same thing happened. I started sharing and telling people People respect you. People deal with you in a great way. And they kept asking me the same question. How did you get the visa? You're a Yemeni person. And for me, I started questioning myself. Did I get the visa because of my expertise? Because of my skills and talent? Did I get the visa because I met the requirements of the visa application? Or just because they perceived me as the holder of the key to the treasures of that giant Saudi business group? It was a question that kept popping up on my head, but there was no clear answer for that. A few months later, I received a new job, I mean a job uh, offer from another employer. And it was with double than the salary that I was receiving from my former employer, with double of the allowances and with fewer working hours. I felt excited and I said, this is an offer that I couldn't resist, I couldn't stop. Uh, I couldn't refuse at all. I accepted the offer, but the employer told me there is a problem. You need first to go to Yemen and apply for a new visa from the Saudi embassy in Sana'a, the capital city of Yemen, because we cannot, uh, we, you cannot work with the same visa of the previous employer. You need to get a new visa and we're going to send you that visa. I said, why not? I'm going to go to my country, meet my parents, sit with them, and even talk to my brothers and sisters and see where they want to study. See my father, where, what, what type of car he wants. I need to now start thinking about the future because I have a very big salary. I went back to Yemen, but at that time, which is the mid of 2014, there was a militia group protesting at the outskirts and entry point of the capital city of Yemen. And that militia group was threatening to host the government and to invade the capital city of Yemen. I went there 
The whole situation was in a total mess, chaos, and turmoil. All the diplomatic mission and embassies, or at least most of them, had to close their offices. And I ended up without having a job, unable to return to Saudi Arabia. And in the mid of a looming war, I started finding myself troubled in my own country, unable to return to Saudi Arabia, unable to keep the promises that I made to my family. And I didn't know what to do. I used to live in a very good, good atmosphere, thinking about the future. But suddenly, I ended up in a civil war, which was looming. And I knew that it's going to be a matter, it's only a matter of months, if not weeks, before the war erupts. And this is really what happened. A few months later, which is the beginning of 2015, the war broke out everywhere in Yemen. And I knew that this war or this civil war is not going to end up here because the rebel group is believed to be back to one of the sides uh, within, I mean, regional powers who oppose each other and who want to fight each other. Saudi Arabia, which is our neighboring country and which is also one of the largest arms importers, found that militia group that took control of the capital and also the government, they found them a threat to their existence. So they, they, decide, they decided to form a military coalition and intervene in Yemen. And since then, I knew that the war is going to be catastrophic and devastating. And this is what really happened again. The war in actors in Yemen, when the war broke out, what they did is that they committed war crimes, all war in actors. They brought our economy to a total collapse. They destroyed thousands of livelihoods. Four million of our students are out of school and they're unable to return to their schools. Teachers, university professors, doctors, and all the public servants in the north of Yemen now are not paid. And it's so difficult for us to see our university professors or teachers without any salary. And it's so difficult for their families. It's not only that. This armed conflict has led to what the UN described as the worst humanitarian crisis, with more than 20 million people in need of, emergent, uh, in, in need of urgent assistance. It's so difficult when a family doesn't know where its meal comes from. And this is the situation in Yemen. People do not know how they will, ha if they have lunch, they don't know where their dinner is going to come from. And this is what the war brought. I lived that situation and I kept asking myself, is this the end of it? And it wasn't. Worse than this is that all the war and actors kept rec recruiting young people. They took advantage of the de deteriorating economic situations and they uh, kept recruiting young people to their sides and the community started seeing young people as the perpetrators of conflict, as one of the causes of the problem. Because Yemen, most, more than half of the population are young people. And they said, they forgot about the political elites who are partially behind this kind of conflict and they started to blame young people. Myself, I saw some of my friends join these war in actors because of the economic need, because they were suffering, their families were suffering, and they wanted to provide them some kind of assistance. And the ca that kind of financial assistance exists only in the pockets of the militia leaders who fuel the conflict. It was so difficult for me. I started to communicate with my friends. I started to try to convince them. You might end up being killed but they didn't listen to me. They wanted money. And soon, the news started to come that these friends got killed and some of them got wounded and some of them got captured by one of the parties. I felt that my life will end with pain and misery. Nothing would be in my life except 
total suffering for the rest of my life. Hopes was van hope was kept vanishing from my sight. This was my scenario, and this is how I lived the uh, how, how I lived the situation. Until I found a door to get engaged in youth-led initiatives. And by joining these youth-led initiatives, hope started to come again. And why is that? It is because young people themselves again. Because when the conflict started, the UN agencies didn't have that much presence on the ground. The international organizations didn't have that much presence on the ground. No one expected how much, I mean, to which extent the, uh, vi uh, the violent conflict would reach. And when the conflict started, we saw young people as the first responder respondents to the crisis. Whenever there are airstrikes, it is young people who rush to, to rescue people. When there is ground battles, it is young people who go and try to open doors and sometimes negotiate with the warrior actors so that they can, they can find uh, a safe route or path for people to get out of that zone. It is young people who started funding raise, uh, raising funds for people who are in need. In one city, one initiative managed to feed more than 2,000 families on a daily basis since three years without any help from any of the international organizations. I started to feel, yes, this is who we are, and this is what we can do. Young people showed strength, showed resilience, showed power, and resourcefulness and creativity. I got more engaged in youth-led initiatives and work, and I joined two uh, peace-building organizations. One of them is on the local level that focuses on uh, building the capacities of young peace builders, and the other one that focuses on uh, empowering youth through educational programs. And after working for years, I got recognized on the regional level because people felt more interested to hear, uh, to, to, to hear about what's going on in Yemen. I got elected by the member organizations of the United Network of Young Peace Builders in the Middle East region as their regional representative. After years of working in peace building field, empowering youth, humanitarian assistance on the uh, local level, I was asked by the United Network to fly to the Netherlands and attend uh, the annual meeting of the International Steering Group. This, this was last year. I was also asked to join my colleagues as a panelist during the Carnegie Peace Building uh, Conversations. I said, okay, I'm going to go to Europe and I'm going to share very powerful stories about the situation in Yemen and about the real strength and resilience of young people in Yemen. When I applied, and I was very sure that I'll get the visa, people in Europe received me and even the embassies received me with a lot of respect when I was representing a Saudi business group. But I got denied. My visa got denied and for reasons that were not realistic, that couldn't make any sense. I found myself seen as a threat. Why? Because I was working as a peace builder. Because I was coming from a conflict-affected community. They might have doubts that I might seek asylum, but this wasn't the case. I just wanted to come and tell stories. I wanted to come and tell people some lessons from Yemen. The lessons that I wanted to share were not told at that time. And the only thing they told me, just share a video from, I mean, very long distance and continents. You just share a video. And this was the word that we can listen to you. I shared a video at that time during the Carnegie Peace Building Conversations. But the experience was still painful. How, was, how I was... I mean, accepted to get to Europe several times and how I was rejected as a peace builder. Some of the lessons that I didn't get the chance to share are, the first lesson is that Yemeni young people are the only segment of the population that contributes posit positively to making peace on all the peace requirements level. 
The international organizations, uh, including the UN, identified that the biggest requirements are economy, strong economy, social and cultural contributions, educational contributions, environmental contributions, and media contributions. And Yemeni people, especially young people, I mean, young people in particular, is the only segment that contributes to all these biggest requirements. In our organization, which is also part of the United Network of Young Peace Builders, Youth Without Borders, we're working on a research uh, paper uh, funded by international donors, and we conducted consultation sessions with more than 80 people in Yemen, and all agreed that it is only youth who are contributing during this conflict to making peace in Yemen and contributing to the different peace requirements. The second uh, lesson that I wanted to share then is that Yemeni people, even those who are engaged in the violent conflict, they want peace, believe it or not. Some, some people would disagree how they're in the battlefield uh, or in the front and they want peace. When we offer opportunities, educational or training, we receive applications even from those who are in the battlefronts. Before that opportunity, they didn't get any opportunity. There wasn't any space for them. And once we announce opportunities, we receive applications from the battlefronts. And one of our success stories is one of the students who got a scholarship, he left the battlefield, he managed to escape, came, received a kind of training, after that, we gave him consultations. We trained him how to write his own CV, how to write an, uh, a motivation letter, and then we gave him an internship opportunity, and afterwards, he could make it and apply for a scholarship, and he's now in Europe studying on a scholarship. And he was one of the fighters with one of the sides. It's not only that. When we open any opportunity, for example, we, we, have, we have opportunities for 100 young people to receive training. But the number of applications we receive exceeds 3,000 and 4,000 people, young people who want to enroll, who wants to receive training. People are eager to learn there in Yemen. The third lesson that I learned is that, and I wanted to share is that young people people are optimistic in Yemen. While the whole world is discussing how difficult is the situation, while the UN trades our pain, because there is a lot of much corruption in delivering aid, and the UN has even eventually admitted that 60% of the aid is diverted to the pockets of the militia groups, or the leaders of the militia groups, while all this corruption is happening, and while 20 million or more than 20 million people are in need of urgent assistance, young people in Yemen are still optimistic. In several youth-led initiatives, we're, we're talking about localizing and implementing and achieving the global goals. Imagine a country with 80% of the population do not have food, we are speaking about peace, we are speaking about gender equality, quality education, we're speaking about reducing inequalities, and we are decided to catch up with all those nations. The other nations say, no one is going to be left behind. We're not going to let you leave us behind. We're going to catch you. We're going to move forward. And we're not going to surrender to this much pain and this much suffering. No we are looking forward to a very better future in Yemen. The last lesson that I want to share is that Yemeni people or young people all over the world cannot work alone if there is no transnational solidarity or cross-regional solidarity. If the conflict is happening in Yemen, it can move to another country. And if Yemeni people do not support young people in other country, the suffering will continue and we're not preserving the dignity of humanity. 
everyone should feel the suffering of everyone in the world. If I'm suffering here, if I, I, if I live here with tranquility and peace of mind, I should also think about people there. Because now, climate change is a real problem and it's a real threat happening everywhere around the world. We might be affected by one conflict, which is armed conflict, but there could be a crisis here, which is environmental. So we should all work together towards a peaceful world. We should all support each other. We should always feel the suffering of each other. We should always seek a world free from violence and a world that everyone believes in the right of his or their peers to live in peace and tranquility. Thank you so much.